Hi, and welcome to this eighth installment in the Making CyberGlads series. I'm building a game called CyberGlads using the Godot game engine. In the last episode, we introduced a scoring system for CyberGlads. Every time the player goes through the entire current version of the game, playing all three NPCs one after the other, a total score is calculated. That adds some replayability to the game. Players will want to replay multiple times to improve on their score. As an added incentive, it would be nice to create a leaderboard with the high scores from all players. In order to do that, we'll need to persist these scores in a backend server of some sort, so that we can remember all the scores and we can show the, the same leaderboard to all the players wherever they are in the world. For the backend part, I'm going to use Silent Wolf. Silent Wolf is a service that I built myself for the purposes of CyberGlads. It's available as a Godot plugin, so you can use it if you want to add a leaderboard to your own game for free. Otherwise, there are alternative backend solutions, and of course you can build your own game server. One advantage with Silent Wolf is that it plays nice with Godot. It's also really easy to use. I'm going to download it now from the Silent Wolf website. So here I am on silentwolf.com. I'm just going to really quickly create an account. Right, and so I should have received an email with a confirmation code, and I have, here it is. That's right, okay. Okay, so I have an account. Next step, I'm going to ask Silent Wolf to generate an API key and a game ID for me. So my game's name is Cyberglass, and here's my API key and my game ID is just CyberGlad, so I'm just going to remember them for later. Right, next step, I'm going to download the SoundWolf plugin for Godot by just clicking on this link. And there, so you can follow, I'm just going to switch to the file system view. So here I have a zip file that I've just downloaded from the SoundWolf website, and I'm just going to copy it over to the add-ons folder of my Godot project. And I'm going to unzip this file here, extracting all the contents, and I'm going to get rid of the zip file. And now if I go back to my Godot editor, I should see the contents of the plugin, and here I do. Right. As a side note, you may have noticed that uh, I'm now using Godot 3.1 for the first time in this series. Porting the game to 3.1 didn't imply any changes to the game so far, so it's been really smooth. But so don't be surprised if the Godot editor interface looks a little different from previous episodes. It's just that I've upgraded to the latest stable version of Godot. Back to our plugin. You'll want to make sure that the plugin is auto-loaded into your game, just like our global script. To do so, I'm just going to go to Project Settings, and here my Auto-Load tab. I'm just going to put in the path to my silentwolf.gd script, and I'm going to put silentwolf as the name, and I'm just going to add it, and here it's enabled as an auto-loaded script. Right, last step before we can use it, we need to configure the plugin. If you open the gd script file called silentwolf.gd, so the one we've just mentioned as the one that we wanted auto-loaded, we see the expected configuration here. You could just fill in the values in these two JSON objects that you see there, but I don't recommend it because if you want to install a newer version of the plugin in the future, it will overwrite your config along with the rest of the plugin. The best way to configure the Silent Wolf plugin is by using the built-in configure functions. Ideally, you would call them from an auto-loaded singleton, so for us, that would be the global script. So I'm going to go to my global script, and inside my ready function, I'm just going to add these two calls to the Silent Wolf Configure API, and I'm just going to make sure to use the correct API key and game ID. Here we go. Just going to properly indent this code there. So 
The first function call here is just to set some general configuration for your game, your API key, your game ID, and your game version. There's also configuration specific to the scores feature that we're going to use to make our leaderboard. This just tells the plugin what scene to open when the leaderboard is closed. Now that that's done, I'm ready to add a leaderboard to my game. So back to Cyberglads. You remember that I set up a loop where the player can play against the three named NPCs in succession. When the loop finishes, so either when the player character dies at some point or if the player defeats Kermit, the final opponent in the game loop, we need to call the server to save the new score. So you remember my arena scene? So this is my arena scene and I've added a little dialogue that is invisible by default that will appear at the end of the three uh, NPC game loop where the user will be prompted for his name and to submit a score. Just going to make it invisible again and so that button here submit score um, we want to it has a pressed event of course like all buttons in Godot and we're going to connect a signal to this pressed event uh, that will um, trigger a function on my arena script and so here in my arena script you see that a new function has been created you know all about signals by now and I'm just going to replace the default code in there by this right so this function takes the player's chosen name from the dialog input field and sets it in a variable in the global object it then calls the silent wolf persist score function passing the player's name and the game's total score finally i'm getting the latest high scores from the server using the get high scores function and i'm hiding the dialog box so that we don't need it anymore because we don't need it anymore. Behind the scenes, Silent Wolf uses Godot's HTTP request node to perform these calls over HTTPS, but you don't need to know anything about that because Silent Wolf takes care of that complexity for you. Now that we know how to store new scores and retrieve them, we want to show them in the form of a leaderboard. We could build a new leaderboard from scratch using container panel and label nodes. You can find out how to play with these node types to build a UI in Godot in my previous videos on building a splash page and a head-up display. But here I'm just going to use the built-in leaderboard scene that comes with the Silent, Wolf, the Silent Wolf plugin. So I'm just going to add a little function whose responsibility will just be to, oops, here we go, new function here who will just load the default leaderboard scene from directly from the Silent Wolf plugin. In my arena scene, I've added another button. So this one, so I'm just going to show the 2D view so you can see it there. It's also invisible by default. Here we go. Um, that will show the leaderboard at the end of a fight or at the end of the three character fight loop. Pressing this button will load Silent Wolf's out of the box leaderboard scene. Um, and uh, I just need to make sure that uh, the pressed event on this button actually triggers uh, the function that we've just defined. And so here I'm going to connect another signal here to a new function. And this new function will just call the one that I've just defined here. Right. You can, of course, customize the layout of the leaderboard scene. If you do, I recommend to create a new scene that extends from the plugin's leaderboard scene and attach a script that extends from the leaderboard script. Otherwise, your changes will once again be overwritten by future versions of the plugin. You could also look at the scene and its attached script to draw inspiration from it and make your own leaderboard. Let's test the leaderboard end to end. I'm going to go through the three NPCs to get a new score and then take a look at the leaderboard. So I'm just going to run the game now. Here we go and switch to the game run window. Here we go. So I'm going to play all three named NPCs in succession. So you remember that in increasing order of difficulty, it's Ernie, then Bert, then Kermit. Here we go. Ernie is not much of a challenge. Here goes Bert. He's a lot faster. I got him, but I don't have a lot of HP left for Kermit. So let's try. Ugh survive for long there okay so you see here my final score is 18 <laughs> not the best score uh, and here I'm prompted as expected uh, for my name and I can submit my score to the back end and now I can show my leaderboard right So here's the latest leaderboard, and you can see that my latest score has already been added. The leaderboard scene checks whether the top scores have been loaded from the back end, and if not, it fetches them. In either case, it displays the latest results. By default, it retrieves an ordered list of the top 10 scores, but you can request more or less through the plugin's configuration or using the API. That's how easy it is to integrate a leaderboard into your own game. You can dig into the code to see how the leaderboard scene works under the hood. 
So if I go back to my editor window and open my leaderboard.gd script here, when the leaderboard is loaded, it checks whether we've already retrieved the scores from the backend. If so, we still have to make sure that we have all the players' latest game scores to display. The plugin saves all of the players' own scores locally, and the leaderboard will merge the scores from the backend with the local scores to show the player how his latest efforts match up with the best without having to do another round trip to the server. If no backend scores have been loaded yet, the leaderboard will try to retrieve them. While we're waiting for the backend call to complete, we want to show a loading message and then replace it with a list of scores once we have them. To do this, I'm using a Godot feature called a coroutine. Coroutines let you stop the execution of a function until something happens and then resume it at the point where you stopped it earlier. This yield function that you see, that you see here does the trick. In this case, we're waiting for a signal called scores received to be emitted before rendering the leaderboard. The signal in question is emitted by the plugin's score script once we get an answer back from the backend to our get high scores request. Coroutines are really useful in combination with signals. We're going to use them a lot more in the future. Of course, since we started from scratch with a new game, I'm the first to play it, and so there's only one score in the leaderboard. Let's add a little script that will run the next time the arena loads to add some more scores so that we can have a proper um, leaderboard rendered. So I'm just going to add some temporary code here to my splash.gd. So in my load arena function, I'm just going to add this little script that is just a series of Silent Wolf API calls to persist some arbitrary scores here. We'll remove this after the next game. Right now, let's just play the game again. I don't actually have to face all three NPCs to see the leaderboard again. It's also displayed after regular fights. So here I'm going to just stop the previous game. I'm going to run the game again. I'm going to move to the game run window. Here we go. And I'm just going to play against Bert playing against Bert. It's the fastest route to the show leaderboard button. And here I have it. I don't really care about my score in this match. Uh, I'm going to show the leaderboard again. And here I have all my scores loaded. And my own real score is in there, in the bottom tier there. And all these arbitrary scores have been loaded as well. Right, so this was a pretty run-of-the-mill implementation of a leaderboard, but there are lots of other things that you can do with leaderboards and lists of player scores and stats. Ours is a global leaderboard, meaning that it, re it remembers all the scores of all the players who've ever played this version of the game. But sometimes this isn't the most compelling thing you can show, especially to new players, because if they're not one of the top players of the game, their names will never appear on the global le leaderboard. Instead, if the player isn't in the top 10, you may want to show a part of the leaderboard that isn't in the top of the rankings, that isn't the top, of the top of the rankings, but maybe the five players who rank just above and below the player's latest score. That way the players, uh, the players have an idea of where they stand and it gives them a short-term target in terms of who they could overtake if they improve their performance just a little. Grouping users by skill level also has benefits in multiplayer games where you could use this information to do matchmaking. To go one step further, you could then organize tournaments and leagues where getting to the top of a certain leaderboard unlocks the next stage of the competition. You may want to group players differently. Say you have an RPG type game with different classes of, cl of characters like wizards, knights, and barbarians. You might want to have different leaderboards for each class. Or if your game has a geographical dimension, like in the case of an augmented reality game that you play outdoors, you could implement a neighborhood leaderboard or a city leaderboard. If the purpose of your game is to have players play with their friends, you could, ha you could also have a social-centric leaderboard where you could see how well you did compared to the people that you know. Time-based leaderboards are another option, just rank players alongside whoever else is playing on that day or at that moment. Mungo's Game Room has a video about how Fortnite uses different leaderboards to keep players interested, whatever their level. In addition to global wins, you get a revolving leaderboard that is reset every week and tells you how often you've been in the top 10 or the top 20. You also have alternate leaderboards where you are grouped together with a random batch of 50 other players. What should you display on the leaderboard? Here we just put the player's in-game name along with their score and their ranking, but you might want to add more visuals to your leaderboard by including each player's avatar. We could also have added the scores that each player got for fighting each of the three NPCs and then maybe rank the player's performance per NPC. 
So there are plenty of ways of getting creative with leaderboards. If you're looking for a great read on the subject, I recommend a Medium article called How to Motivate Using Leaderboards, where the authors, Omar Ghanai and Stephen Ledbetter, explore the psychology of leaderboards beyond the scope of video games and how to design the perfect leaderboard for your application. If you have an interesting use case for a leaderboard, I'd love to hear about it, so don't hesitate to reach out. That's it for this edition of Cyberglads. As always, you can download the latest version of the game on the cyberglads.com website. Let's see whether you can make the leaderboard. Thanks for listening.